I'm Jennifer Alessio, and I serve as the children's pastor here at Heights Church. I've been blessed to serve here for seven years, and I love telling kids about Jesus. It is one of my favorite things to do. I love telling them that God made him, that God loves them, that he has a good plan and purpose for their lives. And most of all, I love seeing kind of the light bulb go off in their face when they realize that God is real and he really loves them and how special that they are to him. It's one of the greatest joys in my life. My other great joy, of course, is my family. And I've been married to my husband, John, at least 17 years in September. I know, isn't that awesome? September 23rd. He's wonderful. He's sitting down in front because he's awesome. You guys can say hi to John. (laughs) He's really great. And God has blessed us with two wonderful kids. My son, Jack, is also here. He's 15. I cannot believe he's 15. And my daughter, Juliana, is 13. And they are wonderful. I can't believe I have two teenagers. It's a whole new world. It's an adjustment in my house to have teenagers, but... They are such a joy and so much fun. I love the conversations that we can have. I also have the cutest dog in the world. For those of you at home and in the room, no, I have the cutest dog. You don't. And her name is Annie. She's a little Dotson. She's 10 years old, and she is forever my baby. If I'm sitting on the couch, she is on my lap. If I'm at the dining room table, she's at my feet. If I'm cooking in the kitchen, She's right below me. I often trip over her. I feel bad because she's so quiet. She's just got to be next to mom, you know, all the time. And we also have two new pets in our home. Our daughter got new pets for her birthday, and they are two dwarf bunnies. Flopsy and Buster. Aren't those the cutest names? They're definitely adorable rabbit names. Um, And I learned about bunnies when we adopted them. So we adopted them from the SPCA. She showed me the picture. She showed me their dwarf bunnies. And I'm thinking, oh, dwarf bunnies. Like, they're going to be really small. That's perfect. I want a small animal is good. No, a dwarf bunny is like this size. I kid you not, okay? And of course, John and I already said yes. So I couldn't be like, oh, no, they're too big. So, um, and I wasn't really sure what I think about the bunnies. I knew that my daughter would love the bunnies. We had an agreement. She's going to take care of them. She's going to clean them. She's going to get them their hay, do the litter box. They're very messy. I'm just going to tell you that. They require a lot of upkeep, but I, I felt at 13 she's ready for that, a good responsibility for her. I wasn't sure I would like them. I'll just be really honest. You know, I love my dog, but a bunny, I don't know. But when I held them for the first time, I was like, oh, I love them. They're so sweet. Like, they're so soft. Anyways, you've got to hold a bunny sometime. They're really great. So I love the bunnies. Um, but enough about me. Let's talk about the message. So, yeah, enough about me. We're, we're, we're moving on. We can talk about the message now. So um, imagine somebody who's just really unique and just a lovely person, they're joyful, they're fun to be around, they're at ease with themselves, they're at ease with others, they go with the flow. There's someone that you really want to get to know. When you're around them, they just have so much joy. And you can see on their face that they're totally different from other people. They respond to situations differently than anyone else you've ever seen. Does that sound like someone you want to get to know? And you want to know why they're different, right? So before I came to know Jesus, I could tell that Christians were different just by looking at them. I could see it on their face. I could see that they were different. I wanted to know why they were different. Um, Because you see, friends, I was raised in a Catholic home. And I grew up believing in God. I believed that he was the creator of everything. I believe that he created me. I believe that his son died on the cross for my sins. And I considered myself a Christian. The problem was is I didn't understand that God created me to have a relationship with him. I missed that part. 
And so God was this kind of faraway person. I knew he loved me. I would sense his presence, you know, when I was in church, right? But I didn't, I didn't know what it meant to have a relationship with him where I could talk to him the way I'm talking with you, where I could feel his love for me, where I could hear him audibly speak to me. But when I did come to know him, I realized that everything I thought about God, I thought about my relationship with him, how the world's works, and how the kingdom of God was, I realized that everything had to shift. Because you see, friends, knowing Jesus shifts our priorities. Last week, Pastor Cheryl talked about in her message about the time that Jesus went up on a mountaintop away from his disciples to pray, and after that, he called his 12 disciples. Today, we're gonna pick back up in that passage, starting in verse 17. And I'm gonna read it for us from the Amplified Version because I just really like how it gets to the heart of what Jesus is saying to us. Then Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples and a vast multitude of people from all over Judea and, and the coastal region and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to listen to him and to be healed of their diseases. Even those who were troubled by unclean spirits or demons were being healed. All the people were trying to touch him because healing power was coming from him and healing them all. So I'd like to pause here and just kind of think about this passage from the um, perspective of the disciples. And I'd like to invite you to put yourself in the disciples' place and think about what they saw and think about what they heard. So there's this new rabbi in town and he wants to talk to you, and you come to know him, and he invites you to follow him, and there's something inside of you that says, yes, you don't know why, but he's totally different from any other teacher, any other rabbi that you've ever come across, and he invites others to follow him as well. One day, he goes off to pray, and he's he's different from everybody else. He goes off by his own to pray, And you wonder, maybe someday he'll teach me to pray like that. Because because you want to have that kind of relationship with the Father that he has. And when he comes back down, he invites you to go down the mountain into a level plain. And it's beautiful. It's green. It's lush. It's amazing. And then all of a sudden, all of these crowds just start swarming in to talk to him because they've heard about him. They think he might even be the Messiah, the one that you've been waiting for. People are talking about that. You're not sure, but you know he's different. And they've come to hear him teach, and they've come to receive healing from him. It's an astonishing scene. And then after he talks to each person individually and loves for them and cares for them and heals them, then suddenly he turns to you. He turns away from the crowd and he looks at you, his new disciple, and your 11 other friends, and this is what he says to you. I'm going to be starting back up here at verse 20. Jesus says, blessed, meaning spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired, are you who are poor in spirit, meaning devoid of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant, and those who recognize their own need for God. For the kingdom of God is yours, both now and forever. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness, are you who hunger now. For the kingdom of God is yours, and forever. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are you who hunger now for the righteousness actively seeking right standing with God for you will be completely satisfied. You can go to the next slide. 
blessed, forgiven, refreshed by God's grace are you who weep now over your sins and repent. For you will laugh when the burden of sin is lifted. Blessed, morally courageous, and spiritually alive with joy in God's goodness are you when people hate you and exclude you from their fellowship and insult you and scorn your name as evil because of your association with the Son of Man. Here, Jesus is letting them know that they may be persecuted or ostracized for following him, but that God will miraculously strengthen them and give them the power to endure. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for your reward in heaven is great, for their fathers used to treat the prophets in the same way. But woe, judgment is coming to you who are rich, and place your faith in possessions while remaining spiritually impoverished. For you are already receiving your comfort in full, and there is nothing left to be awarded to you. Woe to you who are well fed, meaning gorged or satisfied now, for you will be hungry. I'd like to propose to you that this passage isn't just talking about being hungry and lacking food and other material things. I like to propose to you that Jesus is saying, woe to you who are comfortable. And by comfortable, you're self-sufficient and you've forgotten that your most important need is for God. And if you continue down this path, that one day you will find yourself very hungry and very hungry for God. Woe to you when all people Speak well of you and praise you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Wow. Jesus just made it clear to his disciples that their priorities needed to shift. And in doing so, he painted a picture for them of what the kingdom of God is like. And how they, as their disciples, needed to behave. How their priorities needed to shift. In the passage I just read to you, I read that each of those in the Beatitudes, each of those blessings can refer back to either righteousness, peace, and joy. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And those are promises that cannot be taken away from you. So every, but we can choose to put them down. And so every time we choose to place our comfort in the things of this world, like materialism, like the success at our job, maybe it's grades, maybe it's being to perform well athletically, maybe it's in a relationship, or maybe it's in our physical appearance. Every time we, ch we choose to put our security and self-worth into a material thing, when we're doing that, we're not realizing it, but we're actually setting down the priorities of the kingdom of God. We are willingly do that. And when we do, we no longer reflect the God who created us. That reflection it, that reflection becomes tarnished. Because you see, friends, we were created in the image of God. We were created to reflect his image to the world. So every time we choose to place our security in Jesus Christ, and we go after our relationship with him, and he changes us from the inside out, we become like God. And so we respond with kindness, we respond with gentleness, our values reflect the values of the kingdom of God, and people are able to see Jesus inside of us. And hopefully, hopefully they feel his love when they're around us. Just like I noticed before I came to know the Lord and I could see there was something different about them. It's like I could see God's love on their face. And that's an invitation to each and every one of us. But when we choose the values of, the, of this world, like Jesus is talking about in this passage, but woe to you who are rich. He's not talking about 
about um, there being something wrong with being materially blessed. The problem is when we place our security and our value so much in those things that we're neglecting our need for God. That's the problem that he's talking about. And when we do that, we put down the kingdom, the values of the kingdom of God. We pick up the value of the kingdom of this world. And God's image becomes tarnished on our face. But when we realize it, all we need to do is pray and ask forgiveness and repent and make different choices. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So my question for all of us is, What image are you reflecting? Are you reflecting the image of God, showing others what the kingdom of God is like? Or are you reflecting the image of the world and its ideals? In other words, are we leading people closer to Christ? Or are we pushing them farther away with our choices? So knowing Jesus shifts our priorities. And the first tangible example that Jesus gives us on how to work that shift out in our lives is to love our enemies. And I'm going to be reading for us starting in verse 26. But I say to you who hear me and pay attention to my words, love, that is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies. Make it a practice to to do good to those who hate you. Bless and show kindness to those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other one. Meaning, simply ignore insignificant insults or losses and do not bother to retaliate, maintain your dignity. So here, Jesus is not saying that we should be doormats and he's not saying that we should ignore conflict. What he is saying is that he is calling us to a radical kind of love. A love that understands that sometimes it's not always worth it to address every insult that comes our way. Sometimes it's not wisdom to do that. It's better just to forgive someone, let it go, but still choosing not to have a root of bitterness grow in our hearts. Now I'm going back to the passage. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. Whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you only love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend money to those from whom you expect to receive it back, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to receive back the same amount. But you are to love. That is unselfishly seek the best or higher good for your enemies. And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. For your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he himself is kind and gracious and good to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your heavenly Father is merciful. So something that I like to think about is that God is a parent. I think that way because I'm a parent, and um, he has all kinds of Evil people do terrible things to his children, which really must hurt his heart really bad. I I can't even imagine that, um, really. I know that the little glimpse I get when someone hurts my child could not even compare to what the heart of God feels, I'm sure. But the thing is, is that I'm a mama bear. You've probably heard that saying. And to be honest, I don't think I'm just a mama bear. I think I'm kind of a grizzly bear. It's the truth. I have to keep her in check. And uh, she doesn't always come out. But I have to say that sometimes she does come out. And when she does come out, I have learned over time that I need to pause. I need to pray. And I really need to think about how I'm going to respond. 
Sometimes if I'm really upset, I should probably give it a day or two, spend some time with the Lord and work that out. And I have to admit, over the years, I've done this imperfectly. Um, recently, I'd say in the past year, there, I got an email from one of my kids' coaches, and I didn't appreciate it, I'll be honest. And um, I just decided to write a response back, which was not the wisest choice. It's not that what I said was wrong. It just, you know, didn't really acknowledge the other person's point of view. And honestly, I think it did more damage between our relationship and that coach than what was already there. And so my husband talked to me about it. And he said, you know, next time, and I would even say from now on, I really want you to have me read those emails before you send them. <laughs> and, um, and he was right to say that. And to be honest, we're accountability for each other. And he actually talked to me in between services, and he said, you know what? You can tell him I always haven't responded the best either. So, and he gave me that permission. <laughs> so I'm telling you that. So we are accountable for each other. And grace, in God's all goodness and graciousness, he did give me opportunity to redeem that situation. And I have to say, I think I have a good relationship with that coach now. So God is gracious with prayer, um, and me doing some work, I feel like we're in good relationship. But it would have been so much better if I had just, you know, used some wisdom and let my husband read it before I sent it off. Or even better, hey, pause and pray about it. Not everything needs to be addressed right away. And over my journey, I have learned that knowing Jesus needs to change the way I respond. Because knowing Jesus changes our priorities. And in my journey with Christ, I've learned three ways that my priorities have had to shift, and I'd like to share them with you. And the first is, knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from rules to relationship. So since I've come to know the Lord, I understand that my focus needs to be on my relationship with Jesus in chair time, in praying, in Bible study, and really getting to know his heart. And through that process, he's changed me from the inside out. That doesn't mean that I can just say, oh, I know Jesus, it doesn't matter how I treat people, or I don't have to follow you know, what the Bible says because I've got a relationship with him. That's, that's not what it is, because Jesus tells us that he didn't come to get rid of the law. He came to fulfill it. What it does mean is that I have learned that I, my heart is changing in the context of a relationship. So I'm spending time praying to him, getting to know him, and the Holy Spirit is changing my heart. And the Holy Spirit brings conviction, like it did with the email that I sent, I just told you about, and shows me where I need to shift. But my focus is no longer, as it was before I came to know him, about the rule itself. Because if all I'm thinking about is trying to do the right thing without the context of a, context of a relationship, I'm just going to mess up. And that's what happens. And the problem with that is, if I just think being a good person and being a Christian is all about rules, where does that leave me when I make a mistake? Where does that leave me when I continue in a lifestyle that I know is wrong? There, that brings in shame. And as Pastor Tim talked about in a few messages ago, I felt disqualified until I knew Jesus and that he loves me and accepts me the way that I am. And what, but I learned a really important shift that it's not about following the rules. Those are important, okay? I'm not saying that sin is okay. It's absolutely not. But my focus has to be on the relationship first because Jesus knows that once I come to know him, he will change my heart. His Holy Spirit will change me. So relationship comes first and then, and then obedience. And my second point is knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from the values of this world to the riches of the kingdom of God. So I have a slide with some lists on it. Here's a list of God's priorities. Or actually, I have that wrong. The world's priorities. 
And on the other side is God's priorities. So the first is power and versus service. So the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but through love serve one another. So I think we can all agree that the world values power. But power is about control. It's, it holds things tightly. It's about going after what we want and using people as a means to an end. Power dehumanizes people and it ultimately usurps the place of God in our lives. Power uses people and it spits them out. In contrast, service looks to add value. When we value serving other people, we encourage them, we build them up, and we help them become who they were created to be. Service empowers others, but power diminishes them. The next is selfishness. So the world tells us that everything in life is about what you want, what you can get, about you feeling comfortable, about you feeling happy. It's all about you. I think we can all agree on that. But Jesus tells us not to be selfish. He encourages us to be humble. Proverbs 22.4 says, The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor in life. But I think a lot of people think that humility is actually about not thinking well of yourself, you know, just being really meek and quiet. And it's about serving others and putting their needs first to the detriment of ourselves. And that's actually not what Jesus is talking about. Being humble is simply seeing yourself the way God sees you. Humble people can readily admit their strengths and their weaknesses. Humble people also understand that in order for them to truly serve another person, they need to care for themselves. Because if they're not tending to their own needs, emotionally and physically and spiritually, they're not gonna have anything to offer other people. And the other thing about humble people is humble people don't self-promote. They wait for God to recognize them. A humble person can be happy, genuinely happy for someone else when that person gets the promotion they want, when that person gets the new house that they want, when that person gets the new car that they want. They can genuinely be happy for them because they are not thinking about themselves so much. They're thinking about others. That's what humble people do. The next is the world values physical appearance, whereas God prioritizes the heart. So the world tells us a lie that our value is tied to how we look, that we need to look a certain way. We need to be fit, we need, we need to be beautiful, we need to wear the right clothes, and to fit into the mold that they're telling us that we need to fit into. And that, is an ex that view is just an exhausting taskmaster. Whereas God tells us that he values, he prioritizes the heart. So in the book of 1 Samuel, Saul had disqualified himself as king. And so God talked to Samuel, he's a prophet, and he told him, I want you to go to Jesse, and I want you to anoint one of his sons to be king. So Jesse brings out all of these sons, and, and God tells Samuel, no, that's not him, that's not him, that's not him. So Samuel's like, uh, Jesse, do you have anybody else? <laughs> because God told me that one of your sons is going to be king, and you just, God didn't accept all these others. And so Jesse said, well, I have this one other son, but, you know, he's not, he's not anybody. He's just a young kid, and he's, he's a shepherd out with the sheep. And so Samuel tells him, we'll go bring him here. And then Samuel sees him and he's like, uh, God, really? This is like this young kid. And this is what God says to Samuel. He said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Amen. 
Now, what God is not saying is he's not saying that we should ignore our physical appearances because our bodies, we need to steward them well. You know, the Bible tells us that our bodies actually house the Holy Spirit, which shows you how special they are and important they are to God. And he does tell us that we need to care for ourselves. So we should take care of our hygiene. We should exercise. We should eat healthy. But the difference here, it's a very slight nuance. The difference is, is that God tells us to prioritize the heart. As in, we shouldn't be so concerned with our outward appearance that we completely ignore our hearts and our relationship with him. Because that's what's important. It doesn't matter how fit or good we look up look on the outside if we're spiritually sick in our hearts that's why focusing on our relationship with God is so important that's what's essential and I just want to say this that um, there may be some of us in here today that aren't happy with what they see in the mirror and I just want to say that I understand that I've spent a good part of my life in my younger years unhappy with how I looked. I was too tall, I was too thin, um, my hair wasn't the right color. When I got older, I was not thin enough. And I spent a lot of years believing and internalizing that lie and focusing on how I looked on the outside. Until after I came to know Jesus, and one day when I was listening to a Focus on the Family radio program, did anybody listen to that? You guys listen to radio programs? Okay. I know I'm dating myself. It was like 20 years ago. Anyways, it was a great program. And I couldn't tell you who the speaker was. But what I do remember, it was a very nice lady. And she said, you know, I encourage all of you young girls to ask God to show you how he sees you. And to ask him to tell you what he thinks of you. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try it. Why not? I'm struggling. I'm going to try this. And the most amazing thing happened to me. In that moment, I felt such a huge presence of God's love for me. It was as, it was as if he was right there in the room next to me, wrapping his arms around me. And I knew how much he loved me. And from that point on, I saw myself differently. And when I was unhappy with what I saw, I'd say, no, God loves me. God says I'm beautiful. And I replaced that lie with the truth. And I'll have to admit, it's a struggle that I continue to have, but I'll remind myself. I'll say, no, God loves me. God says I'm beautiful. He says I'm, I'm supposed to look the exact way that I do, and so are you. So I encourage you, friends, if you believe that, you have believed that lie in the past, to not believe that. That is, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is not the truth. God created you to be exactly who you are and to look exactly the way you do. And there are so many different ways to be beautiful and to be handsome. And I'll just say this, this isn't just a struggle for women, it's a struggle for men too. They may not you know, think about themselves as beautiful per se, but I'm not a man, but I think my husband would agree with that. But um, men generally want to be fit, right? But God loves you the way that he is. He cares about our heart. And the next is, the world tells us that we should value or prioritize money or success, whereas God tells us that we should value our, and prioritize our relationship with him. So, you know, the world tells us the lie that we are not valuable unless we are achieving a certain thing. It could be a job, it could be success at job. If you're a student, it could be, it could be relationships, it could be grades and sports performance. And it's not that goals aren't important. God calls us to steward the gifts that he's given as well. We know that from the, terrible, the parable of the talents. He's given us gifts. He wants us to use them. The problem lies is when we're so focused on what we can do and achieve, and that becomes an idol. 
and it has replaced the value of God in our lives. That's the problem, is when we get things mixed up. Our relationship with God should be what defines us and what gives us value. Because you see that, friends, if your value is in what you can do and achieve in this world, that's such a fleeting value because it's only as good as the next thing. So let's say you get a really good review at work. Well, that only lasts until the next review, right? You might be worried about what that review is saying, but if you know that you are valuable to God no matter what, and that he loves you and he's created you for a purpose and that you're adopted and accepted, then hey, I'll, I'll read the review. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, I can learn from it. But it's not going to rock you to the core the way it will be if your only value is in what you can do. And lastly, the world values platform and influence whereas God prioritizes a quiet life. I love this scripture from 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands. Friends, never underestimate the value of a quiet life. A life that is dedicated to serving God and serving those around them. Whether you are a mom at home caring for your children, for infants, loving and serving your husband, cleaning toilets. Amen? That's in service to God. Can I just say that? <laughs> toilets? I told my mom, I'm kind of rabbit trailing here, but it's funny, so I'll tell you. I told my mom when I was growing up, I'm like, I don't want to clean the toilet. That's disgusting. And she said, who's going to clean your toilet when you grow up? And I thought, well, you're right. i got to learn how to clean the toilet. But anyways, I clean toilets to the Lord. That is not my favorite thing, I just have to say. But I do it out of service to my family. Never underestimate the value of working hard for the Lord at work, working at it with all of your might. That is such a wonderful witness, such a wonderful image that you were reflecting to the world. Now, the world values platform and influence, and having influence isn't necessarily in and of itself bad. It depends on what you're doing with the influence. So, are you doing, is influence all about you so that you can get people to admire you and they think you're cool and you've got cool ideas and you're in the in crowd and popular, whatever that means? Um, or are you doing it because you want to influence others and improve their lives? And tell them about Jesus. When I, I look on social media, I have social media accounts. You guys have social media accounts? I have Facebook and Instagram. And some of them are really good. Others are not. Some of them are just kind of silly, which is okay. And then others are really horrible, absolutely horrible. And they encourage young people to do terrible, terrible things. And so... What kind of influence are we having? These are things that we need to pay attention to. What image are we reflecting to the world with what we're posting on social media? And I'll just say this. We also need to pay attention to who we're following. I'm going to give credit to Pastor Tim. This was his idea. It was a good job, buddy. So um, he brought up the idea of what story do our follower, the people who are following tell? So if someone were to look at my social media account, what are they going to see about who I'm following? Are they going to see that I care about the Lord and encouraging others? Or is it going to see that I'm following a bunch of celebrities and other terrible things on social media? So we need to pay attention with who we're following and what kind of message that is giving to others. So knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from the values of this world to the riches of the kingdom of God. And knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from me to others. So as I alluded to earlier, before I came to know Jesus, I thought about myself a lot. I thought about what I wanted, what I liked, what would make me happy. And when I got my feelings hurt, I had a lot of pity parties for one. Anybody else know pity parties? Yeah, you get out your violin, and you play it, and then you nurse, your, and you pet it like a little kitty cat, and you just sit there and go on and on about yourself. 
And when I came to know Jesus, I realized that my priorities needed to shift. And that not, the world didn't revolve around me. And I don't have that much power, really. You know? I'm not, not everything needs to be about me. The Lord showed me that I need to think about others. I need to think about how I talk to them, how I treat them. I need to think about what's going to make them happy, how I can be a blessing to them. Because knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from myself to others. Jesus also taught me that I needed to be a peacemaker. Now, I have to admit, in and of myself, I'm not a natural peacemaker, okay? I am um, very much a black and white thinker. I have to say that Jesus has shifted me, and I'm way more comfortable in gray, okay? (laughs) I can much more understand that now. But in my natural self, I'm a very black and white thinker. I'm very right and wrong. And as is shown in my inner mama bear, I have a strong sense of justice. So in a conflict, my natural tendency is not necessarily to be a peacemaker. It generally is, all right, let's have it out. And um, maybe that's not, <laughs> that's not always the right thing, you know? And um, anyways, uh, recently, probably, a, and by recent, I mean like not a year ago, like a week and a half ago, I was in a meeting uh, with other members of the church staff, and another um, person came up, and she's lovely. She's just a natural peacemaker. She can always see both sides. Very diplomatic. Like someday she'd be an amazing diplomat. You know, we could really use her in the federal government. Anyways, so she's really, really good at that. And I said, you know, she is a peacemaker. And then, out of my mouth, I go, and I'm not. For the world to hear, everybody to hear. One of my coworkers told me later, he's like, I can't believe you just said that. Like, there she said that out loud. And afterwards, I I automatically knew I was wrong. But you know how after you say things, you kind of justify it to yourself? So then I kind of went through that all day long about how I was kind of justifying it to myself. And before I went to bed, the Lord just said, I need to talk to you about something. I'm like, yeah, I know. And he said, I need you to not have such such a flippant attitude about being a peacemaker. He's like, you are absolutely called to be a peacemaker. And I said, I know. And I repented and I asked forgiveness. And then God, in all of his graciousness, he showed to me he showed me actual memories of when I was a peacemaker. And then I, and he said, you are a peacemaker. Look at all these things that you've done and how you respond to people and how you see things. And he reminded me of how much I value and love people because I do. I deeply value them. And then he showed me something very important. And he said, you know what? Here's the issue, Jennifer. You were looking at the struggle inside of yourself. You are identifying with that struggle instead of identifying with the work of my Holy Spirit in your life. And I was like, oh. He's like, don't identify with the struggle. Because, friends, struggling isn't wrong. We're all going to struggle with things until we come to know Jesus. Struggling is not a sin. It's how you respond to it. And Jesus showed me, you're responding well. That doesn't mean you're not a peacemaker. It just means your wiring's different. So I want to encourage you, friends, if you find yourself struggling, don't believe the lie that, there's some, that you're sinning because you're struggling. You're not. It's what you do with the struggle that matters. It's how you respond. So knowing Jesus shifts my priorities from me to others. And he showed me how to be a peacemaker. And I know he'll do that for you too. So friends, as I wrap up, I have two challenges for you. In your chair time this week, ask yourself the following question. What image am I reflecting to others? God's or the world's? And the second is, read through the scriptures listed in point two. They're in your message notes. If you're online, you can find them there in the chat. Um, And then they're also in your planner if you're with us in the building. And ask God what priorities that you need to shift so that you can more accurately reflect God's image to the world. I'm going to pray for us. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son. Because of your son, we know that we can have a relationship with you. That you're not a distant God. God, you're a relational, you're a personal God. And we can have a relationship with you and talk to you just like we talk to our friends. I just want to say to those of us here who have yet to begin a relationship with Jesus, you've yet to ask him into your heart for a personal relationship to be the Lord and Savior of your life, I invite you to say this prayer with me. And with every head bowed, you can raise your hand and let us know that you want to begin a personal relationship with Jesus today. Dear Jesus, I ask that you would come into my heart, ask you to forgive me for everything that I've done wrong that's outside of your will for me. Thank you for coming to die on the cross for my sins. And thank you, God, I, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. for everybody else, I ask that you would just touch all of our hearts here online in the building, God, and show us which priorities that we need to shift so that we can more accurately reflect your image to the world. Because Lord God, we desire to do that. We don't want to be tarnished. We want the people that we meet to see you. We ask that you would help us do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes, and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. And we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness. And we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope and joy through the restoration ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you. 